Thanks for joining us for an Every Nation Sunday Sermon. This message is from our Hammersmith congregation. For more information on our church, or to see how you can be involved, please visit everynation.co.uk. Okay, you guys. So, um, here's what we're going to do this morning. I, uh, I'm going to preach a message that is actually very, uh, quite personal to me in my, uh, in my journey, in my story, both as a pastor and as, as a dad, as a husband, as a Christian, as a follower of Jesus. Um, and uh, I'm going to go from a passage that I'm just going to guess you've probably not heard someone preach from before. And if you have, wow, that's just wow. I'm going to preach from Ezekiel chapter 1, because that's where I'm going to go from. And uh, if this is a passage that, uh, that you're at all familiar with, then you're already wondering, like, where in the world is he going to go with that? That's a wonderful question. I'll be happy to answer that here in a few moments. And uh, if you're not at all familiar with, uh, with the Bible, the scriptures, or I guess you're joining in to this, uh, to this church, welcome. And uh, Ezekiel is just a fascinating book that's located um, just a little bit right of center in the Bible. And uh, it, it, it chronicles the story of a man named Ezekiel in a very, um, a very uh, tragic and unfortunate time uh, in the history of the people of Israel. And so these were God's unique and special people. They weren't his favorite people, as if like he looked across the earth and decided, well, these guys are my favorites, so I will make them mine and uh, just let everyone else sit at the unpopular table in the cafeteria or whatever. But uh, these, he selected these people so that through those people, he would be able to bring blessings to all people. Because God is really into partnerships with humanity and to bless humanity so that humanity might be a blessing. And he just does this. He just does this. He does this even now still, having brought blessing through this, these people, ultimately whom Jesus has come from, to now bring blessing even to people like us who sit here, who sit here in, in London in 2015. And this is what he does. But this was a moment where his partners were not quite the faithful um, people that he was wanting them to be. And so they've hit a quite a bit of a snag, which we'll get into here in a moment. But let's jump into Ezekiel chapter 1. We'll set up a little bit of context for who this Ezekiel guy is, and then, uh, then we'll, we'll uh, be able to go from there. So here's, here's Ezekiel chapter 1, and it just enters with a bang. This is Ezekiel. Um, it says, In my 30th year, in the fourth month, on the fifth day, while I was among the exiles by the Kavar River, the heavens were opened, and I saw visions of God. Hello. Nice to meet you. <laughs> hanging out by a river, uh, and I'm seeing visions of God. So this is, uh, these are usually people that you walk past without making eye contact, I'm sure, just on the street. But uh, this is Ezekiel, this is his introduction. He has a lot to say here, and there's a lot packed into this introduction. And there's a few things I'm going to ask you to remember. I'm going to ask you to remember because they, they're going to be important, and they may or may not come up later. So first of all, uh, how old is Ezekiel here? How old is he? He's 30. He's 30 years old. He's definitely 30 years old. But remember that he's 30 years old. Um, and, uh, and where is he? Yeah, he's among the exiles by, by what? The Kavar River. He's by a river. He's 30 years old, and he's by a river. Now, we get a few more details here. It says, on the fifth month, it was the fifth year of the exile of King Jehoiakim, the word of the Lord came to Ezekiel, the priest, the son of Buzi, by the Kavar River in the land of the Babylonians. There the hand of the Lord was on him. And so this is a little bit more just rounding out our context here to help us know timeline where this is all happening. And what this is saying is that Ezekiel is among the exiles, which is essentially meaning that he's not home. He's a refugee, but more than just a, a refugee that had to leave his home, he was forced from his home. He was kidnapped from his home. And it's been five years. It's been five years since he's been home. So when this is fifth year in exile. He's celebrating his 30th birthday, if you will. And here he is among the, uh, the exiles in Babylon by the Kavar River. The Kavar River is, call it a river, is a little bit generous. It's basically like an irrigation canal. Uh, likely, uh, Ezekiel is part of some kind of slave crew that's actually building this irrigation canal in order to irrigate Babylonian crops. So you just imagine that you've been captured by a, like a foreign enemy, and now this enemy is forcing you to build infrastructure in order to build their country. I mean, this is, right, this is adding just salt to the wound, correct? And so this is, this is Ezekiel, not exactly having a good day, good year, good decade, probably. It's just, would be accurate. Things aren't going very well for him. And one of the things we need to know right now that is very, very important about Ezekiel 
is that it says that he is the son of Buzi, who was a priest. Ezekiel himself is in line to be a priest. And priests in those days, the very basic understanding of a priest is someone who just mediates between the realm of God and, and ours, somehow who bridges the gap or, or helps us to connect with the divine in some way. And so uh, the God of Israel had priests, and they came from a family line. And so uh, what this simply means is that Ezekiel's dad, Ezekiel's granddad, great-granddad, and as far back as you want to go, have all been priests. This is like his family destiny. This is his lot. This is his identity. This isn't just his work or his occupation. This is everything he has he's eaten, and slept, and breathed for his first 30 years of life, anticipating the moment where he would be able to step into the family business and to take on this amazing calling that God, calling that God has assigned his family, his people. And it's when you're 30 years old, it's when you're 30 years old that you're actually first eligible to start your work as an official priest. So for five years, he's been in exile, but I'm sure for his entire life, he's been looking forward to his 30th birthday. Now, in America, we have a little bit similar of a mindset or an idea when, uh, when you turn 16 years old. When you're 16 in America, you're eligible to get your driver's license, which means you are free to cause massive chaos on the roadways <laughs> like, of all your fellow citizens. Um, and uh, looking back now and how having, uh, I have a 10-year-old who's only six years away from that moment, it is shocking as a society that we would ever allow a 16-year-old on the road. That is just... Who thought of such a law? That was, that was ridiculous. I don't know who did that, but somehow I survived. But I still remember turning, you know, 14 and then 15 and remembering how much I was looking forward to my 16th birthday. It means freedom, it's independence, it means you just get the open road and, uh, and, and like everything that goes along with it. And, uh, and so you dream of your 16th birthday and you think of the first places that you're going to go. You plan your first road trips. You, like back in those days, before MP3 players, like, yeah, I had a mixtape, right? A mixtape of like, of all the songs I was going to listen to on my first, like, ride in the car, you know, bump them up, right? And uh, like, no CD player in that car, just tape player, right? You with me on this? Anyone with me on that? All right, young people, just turn to your parents later, ask them what a tape is, and, <laughs> right? And so everything was built up to this moment. Everything was built up to this moment. Now imagine I turned 16 years old. This didn't happen for me, fortunately. But imagine if, if you're an American and you're turning 16 years old, and it's your 16th birthday, and you head down to the Department of Motor Vehicles, which is our place where you actually get your license, and it's closed. And not just closed, but it's boarded up. And it's moved. And it's not coming back. And there's, there's just no way to get your license anymore. Well, that's a small fraction of what Ezekiel's feeling. His whole life has been built up to this moment in his 30th year. And now, it's gone. It's gone. And the pain of this moment has to be intense. So to set the stage a little bit and to help us enter into Ezekiel's story, I want us to, uh, <clears throat> we're going to observe some historical renderings of, of what is happening here in this moment. So next slide. So this is a, you're welcome. This is what I do in my free time. Um, so this is Jerusalem. This is Ezekiel's home. This is where he's from. Next slide. But here comes along Babylon, which is a foreign empire and a very, very powerful military superpower, an evil, nasty bunch, not the nastiest or the most evil, in world history for sure, but they're definitely going to make your top 10 list. They're not a nice crew, and they come to ransack Jerusalem. And five years prior to when Ezekiel was writing this, they took some of the best and the brightest and many of the leaders out of Jerusalem. They didn't take it all. They didn't ransack the town completely. They didn't level the town completely. That was actually still to come later. They eventually would. But at this point, they've just kind of taken a select few and removed them and taken them away out of the country itself. So Ezekiel is sitting back at home thinking that, well, there's still a home to go back to. Next slide. And so Ezekiel is among, this, is among this crew that has been initially dragged away from his homeland. And here he is sitting by the river. And you have to imagine what, what he's thinking about. You have to imagine what he's thinking about. Surely he's thinking about his 30th birthday. Surely he's thinking about his calling, his identity, his purpose that's been completely lost now, that he's sitting by the Kavar River as opposed to back home in Jerusalem. 
But specifically, why? Why would he be thinking of Jerusalem? Or why would he want to go back to Jerusalem? Or what is it about Jerusalem that he would be longing for? And the answer to that would be the temple. The temple. Because the temple is where the priests would work. And the temple was the most significant piece of like architecture and the most significant piece of plot of land in the entire world, as far as a guy like Ezekiel is concerned. This is the place where the unique, manifest presence of God lives. And the priests would be there, again, to help mediate and minister to the presence of God. It was a very high calling. It was extremely important. And Ezekiel has to be thinking of, can I just get back? The temple's still there. It's still back home. Maybe there's a way. Maybe if I pray hard enough, like maybe if I fast, uh, maybe if I, like, maybe if I can just pull myself together spiritually, maybe I could get myself back home. Maybe God might answer my prayer. Maybe I could get back because the temple is back there, and the temple is filled with God's presence, and that is exactly where the priest wants to be. And to describe what God's presence in the temple looks like, you have to get a little bit into the history of, of the temple and what Ezekiel would understand and have really like, ingrained deeply into him. Next slide which comes out of the book of 1 Kings, when the temple was originally constructed. It says that the priests withdrew from the holy place, the middle of this central building, and the cloud filled the temple of the Lord, and the priests could not perform their service because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled his temple. This was a description of kind of their inauguration of the temple. And what happened was it was just a building. It was just an ornate building until God's presence filled it. And when it describes what that looks like, Here's an like artistic rendering of it, but it describes it as being filled with the glory of the Lord. And so here we have the Ark of the Covenant, which you might recognize from Indiana Jones. And um, for all of you into that kind of stuff, uh, I kind of am. And so here's, here's the Ark of the Covenant, which contains some artifacts that are really important from Israel's history, a really significant piece uh, of history for them. And what you see here, which is important to note, is it's just a big fancy box but there's two kind of living creatures that sat on the top of the box, made, made, made out of gold, and, uh, and they have wings. Do you see the wings? And the wings are extended towards one another, and the tips of the wings, the tips of the wings are like, are like touching one another. You see how they're almost touching one another there? You see that? And so this was an image that for a priest, you would know like the back of your hand. And when the glory of God filled, the presence of God filled the temple, it's represented by that kind of like orb of light there, it would rest, because you can almost see how the wings are almost framing in, like almost like a little bit of a platform, right? It's almost like the wings are framing in a spot for the glory of God to actually inhabit or fill, and that's, that's exactly the central place where it came. So to understand the presence of God, you have to understand that the glory of God came to the temple, and specifically, that's where the glory of God went. And when we say glory, what we mean, glory is this word that means weightiness or significance, it literally means just heavy or weight to it. It's kind of like, uh, I use this example, like uh, as Americans, we go often on holiday to Mexico, which is obviously a developing country. And one of the popular things to do there is go shopping along kind of the touristy traps. And I don't know if you've ever been to kind of a holiday location where they have all these kind of touristy stuff. And you, uh, you sample all the wares and you look at all that they have for sale. And uh, if you want to buy a pair of sunglasses, as an example, typically you pair up a pair of sunglasses and it almost breaks in your hand the second that you pick it up, correct? Oh, it's actually usually fine, and then once you hand over the money, it falls apart, right? You just buy, it's like, you just buy, you just know that it's cheap. But glory is this idea when you go to a really nice upscale sunglass shop, and you pick up a sunglasses that cost at least 100, 100 pounds, and you look at this, and it's just the comparison between the two, one is flimsy and cheap, and not, and the other has got, well, it's got glory to it. It's got a significance to it. It's got a, you can tell, can't you tell? Can't you tell? It's, it's, uh, yeah, it's kind of like the, the, what happens when someone of prominence or importance walks into a room. If the prime minister were just to stroll in here, or Her Majesty were just to somehow stroll in here. Like, we would say, like, there would be a weight that would enter the room to where all attention, I'm sure you would all still listen to me very politely, which I appreciate, but <laughs> I'm sure all attention would go, why? Because the weight, the significance of that person, that moment. We would call that, biblically, the glory of that person. And so when God's glory comes, when God enters the room, it's like nothing else matters. Everything else is just like chintzy and flimsy compared to him. It's, it's, it's what causes people to drop to their faces and fall to their knees because like looking polite anymore like kind of goes out the room. When this glory enters the room, it is that 
overwhelming. And this, this is where the glory was. Now, Ezekiel said that he saw visions of God. He's hanging out by the river. He's surely going through all this kind of psychological torment, I'm sure, thinking about God and his glory and the temple and Jerusalem and his priesthood calling and all these sorts of things. But he's sitting by the river and he gets a vision. He gets a vision. What kind of a vision does God give a priest by a river in his 30th year who is in exile longing to go back home? That's a wonderful question. I'm super happy you asked. Let's find out, shall we? Next slide. Oh, oh, here's, uh, let's go to the next one. Let's just skip that. Awesome. So I looked and I saw a windstorm coming out of the north and the men's cloud with flashing lightning and surrounded by brilliant light. And the center of the fire looked like glowing metal. And in the fire was what looked like four living creatures. And all four of them had faces and wings. And the wings of one touched the wings of another. Now, no, 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 picture this for a second. There's four living creatures, okay? And they're weird. I'll just, we'll just say that up front. They're weird. You can look at details if you want, but let's just, let's just step back and look at the bigger picture here. Four living creatures, and they have their wings outstretched, okay? Like, yay. And if you think of four living creatures that all have their wings outstretched about like this, and you put them in a box, their wings are touching one another, forming like a little bit of a square or a rectangle. Living creatures with wings extended and the tips are touching one another. Does this sound familiar to you? So far, it should a little bit. Should a little bit. Maybe you fell asleep. But it should a little bit. Next slide. And as I looked at the living creatures, I saw a wheel. I saw a wheel on the ground beside each creature. So apparently these creatures are mobile, and they have, they have wheels. They have wheels. And whatever this thing is that these creatures are and are a part of in this vision, it's moving. It's got a wheel. It's moving. Next slide. So above the vaults, over their heads, the heads of these creatures, was what looked like a throne. And high above on the throne was a figure like that of a man. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. Now, now watch what he says there. <laughs> that, like, listen to what he's trying to say. Yeah, it was, uh, it was sort of like the appearance of kind of-ish, right? He doesn't even, he can't even describe to you what he's seeing. He's seeing something so mind-bending, so mind-blowing that he's just, I, uh, it's kind of like it was sort of, um, it was wow. And his word, his wow, it was, like, it was the glory of the Lord. Well, that phrase is a very important phrase because we know where that phrase comes from. We just saw First Kings. What, what, where is the glory of the Lord supposed to be? In the temple, back in Jerusalem. And he's seeing it out in the middle of Babylon by the Kavar River. <clears throat> so, just to uh, get ourselves a quick little review, next slide. Here's Ezekiel. And he's hanging out by the Kavar River there. Next slide. And uh, he sees something. And this is what he sees. I'm sure this is extremely accurate to what he, uh, had, what he had in front of him. Four creatures, wings extended, a forming like, almost like a little bit of a platform. They have four wheels by each of the four living creatures. And there was a throne kind of on this little platform that these creatures are making. And there was an appearance of something, someone like a man sitting on this throne. But, he, but Ezekiel described it as this is the glory of God. This is the presence of God himself, the unique presence of God that, uh, that's supposed to be in Jerusalem. And so, next slide. So this stirs up a very, very important question, which is what, in God's name, God's glory, doing in Babylon? What in God's name is God's glory doing in Babylon. This is not where it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be in this nice little static building uh, above this little box. But what Ezekiel sees is the glory still has its little platform formed by these creatures, 
But it's almost as if God's presence now has wheels and is mobile. I like to call this the Godmobile. It is an off-road vehicle, very off-road. It's literally off the road. <laughs> yeah, but it's moving and it's approaching and it's coming to him. And for a priest, the son of a priest, a son of a priest called to be a prophet, 30 years old, sitting by a river, seeing the presence of God come toward him on wheels, he has to be wondering to himself, what are you doing here? I don't know if you've ever had a moment like Ezekiel's moment, but I know that I have. I've had moments where I've sat beside my, uh, my Kavar rivers. I've had moments where disappointment and disillusion have been almost uh, consuming. I've had moments where I've sat and looked at my life or thought about just my place in this world and, just, and I just have to wonder sometimes, is this it? Is this all? I remember sitting in college uh, in my dorm room and I, I just remember prior to being a Christian thinking to myself, is this, is this it? And I remember thinking to myself, God, if you're real, then how do I get to you? How could I get, how can I find you? How can I get, how can I know? And of course, the first things I immediately begin to assume or start to think about are, is there a book I can read? Um, can I polish up my manners? Uh, is there some morals that you'd like me to iron out here? Like, what is it that you would have me do in order to be able to get to you? Because whatever I've got going on right now, it seems to leave some kind of a void of meaning and purpose. And I feel like life is supposed to be more than this. I feel like life is supposed to be more than just getting a decent education at an okay uni and going on to make like a reasonable income, raise 2.3 kids, like become a nice American and like just like eat lots of McDonald's, which is what we do, of, of course. And like, right, there's got to be more than this. There has to be more than this. There has to be some bigger picture to the world. There has to be some kind of response to the junk that happens into the world. Stuff that happens in Paris, it doesn't seem like it's supposed to be that way. But if there is no God, there's no reason why it shouldn't be that way. Like, God, could you please help me figure out how I can fit in this universe that seems like it's filled with meaning and beauty, and yet all I feel is emptiness and isolation and loneliness. You, could you tell me how to get to you? Maybe, uh, maybe you have moments like that. Maybe you're in a moment like that. Maybe, maybe you've had a moment where you realized your plans are not panning out. Where the hopes that you had placed in where your life might be, maybe, maybe even you're, you're a Christian and you, you, you had expectations of what you expected God to do in your life and you, you've arrived at a place or you've been at a place in your life or you will be at a place in your life where you realize your expectations are not lining up with what God's actually doing. And it's frustrating, painful, disorienting, and it causes a lot of questions to stir inside of us, which I'm sure Ezekiel had as well. The kinds of questions that we ask are, God, do you care? Do you see where I'm at? Because this ain't exactly happy town. Do you notice how I'm feeling? Do you see my anxiety? Can you feel my disappointment? I thought you were taking me to a place of like where things were going to be all okay. Everything was going to be filled with rainbows and puppy dogs and unicorns. And like, I thought, I thought this maybe this Christian life as long as I was faithful to you, as long as I obeyed you, that everything would be totally... And now maybe you're realizing it's not all fine all the time. And you start wondering, well, God, do you, do you care? Have you left? Are you even there in the first place? And you start wondering, well, m maybe you still care. 
but are you just weak? Are there things happening in my life that you're just powerless to do anything about? Maybe for Ezekiel, he's, like, I'm sure he's wondering this. Like, I doubt he's questioning the existence of God, but I'm sure he's questioning the ability of God. Did you just turn a blind eye? Did you have a senior moment? Did you slip off your throne? Are you weak or have you abandoned me? And then all of a sudden the glory of God comes near to him on wheels. And Ezekiel gets a profound answer that I think you and I need to hear constantly. And it's not an answer that just solves all of our immediate problems. It's not an answer that immediately rescues us out of our circumstances and situations. But it's an answer that shouts profoundly that he does care and know he has not abandoned me. Every impulse that I had in my college dorm room said, God, would you tell me how to get to you? How do I get out of this place of despair? And you know what God's answer is? Just sit, because I'm coming to you. The good news of Jesus is not that God has given us an instruction manual about how to get to him. The good news of Jesus is that God has come to us. The good news is, is that no matter what pit we might find ourselves in, even one of our own digging, God isn't the one that says, well, here's a ladder. Start with step one. Try step two. Straighten out your morals. Figure out your marriage. Like, give a little bit to charity. Like, up your morality game. And then we'll talk about whether or not you and I can hang out and be cool. The good news of Christianity says, I see you in your pit. I see the pit you've dug for yourself, and I'm coming to you. I don't plan on leaving you in that pit. And the promise to Ezekiel, as well as his people, was they were not going to stay in exile. But this was an exile of their own doing. This was an exile of their own discipline and punishment. And yet God said, I'm not going to leave you there. I'm not even going to let you go there alone. I want so many more answers from God than he actually gives. But I find that the answers that God gives are rarely the ones that I want, but always the ones that I need. He does care. And I am not abandoned. And he can find me. And you. He can find you. If he can find Ezekiel by the Kavar River, in the middle of nowhere, in the midst of his hopelessness and despair, he can find you can find you. He can find you in a place when it seems like God is like the farthest thing from you. He can find you in a place that is filled with doubt and skepticism. He can find you there. He can find you in a place where it seems like anxiety and depression just seem to be oppressing. He can find you there. He can find you in the midst of your sin. He can find you in the midst of your pits. He can He can find you there. He has no plans to leave you there, but he is not going to allow you to somehow come up with this scheme to get yourself to him. It's by his grace that he will come to you and walk you through whatever you are going through. This is the good news. He can find you. And whether you're a Christian or you're not yet a Christian, and I say that with great optimism, it doesn't matter where you start because God can find you anywhere. You think you've outthought him? You think you've outreasoned him? You think you've got a, like an airtight argument against him? Oh, he can find you there. Which you assume to be airtight, he'll find the holes in it. He'll find you. He's really good at this. This is what he does. But the good news that Ezekiel got of a God that was coming to him, a God that was finding him, a God that was coming to him in his place of despair, didn't stop there. The good news for us here today is that we've got a little bit of an upgrade. Because God came to Ezekiel on wheels. He came to the son of a priest, called to be a prophet, sitting by a river when he was 30 years old, on wheels. But just about 400 years later, there was another son of a priest, called to be a prophet, sitting by a river, also 30 years old. His name was John. And he, just like Ezekiel, was grieving over the reality that God's people were still in a pit. And John saw something. 
similar to what Ezekiel saw. When the presence of God came to Ezekiel, it came on wheels. It was mobile. It was moving. It wasn't static, which was mind-bending for him to think. But John didn't see God on wheels. John got to see God on legs. And when Jesus of Nazareth came near to him, it could be described as nothing less than the glory of God coming near. God with us. God among us. God stepping in to our valley and to our pit. God coming to find us. And more than just some idea of wheels, this, like that God's like glory could somehow be mobile and find us. We have something better than wheels. We have legs. We have flesh. We have a human that has come, God in human flesh that has come to find us and to rescue us, that says profoundly, I have no intentions of leaving you in your pits. I have no intention of leaving this city in its pit of doubt and unbelief. But he can find it, no matter how deep, no matter how dark it might be buried. He can find it, and he can walk with it and lead it out. This Jesus, this Jesus is the only God who knows what death is like, who has tasted of death, the very bottom of the pit itself, and he's the only God who knows the way out. And the resurrected Jesus says, it's never so dark that my light can't shine. You're never too far from me, and his grace is always sufficient. Father, I want to thank you that you are the same yesterday, in Ezekiel's day, in ages past, and even today. And you will remain that same God, even tomorrow and as we look out into the future. And I thank you that you come to the people that you love, that you find them, and that you're so good at that. I thank you that no matter what lies we believe here today, that either you don't care or you don't exist, or you've somehow abandoned us. I think that those lies are just that, lies. And I thank you for the truth that you remind us of constantly. That you are strong. That you are mighty to save. That you are present. That you're available. And we don't have to crawl out of our own pits. We don't have to work our way to get to you. We simply have to call out to you and humbly receive the reality that you have already come to us. So thank you, Jesus, for that. Thank you, Jesus, for finding us. I'm praying for anyone that's, that's currently in a pit, that can currently find themselves by their own Kabar River. And Father, I want to ask that your glory would come, your presence would come, that you would be with them, that you would minister to them in that place. God, for all the answers that they might not have, I'm praying that you would give them the answers that they ultimately need. I'm praying that your power and your love would consume them, in Jesus' name. God, for everyone here that is headed towards the Kavar River at some point in the future, maybe near future, God, I'm asking that you'd prepare our hearts. Prepare our hearts that we might continue to trust that you are strong and that you are loving and that you will never leave us nor forsake us. And don't let our circumstances don't let our friends, don't let this culture, don't let anything lie to us to tell us anything differently. Help everything that's a lie to fall flat to the ground and all that is true resound loudly in our hearts and our minds. Thank you for this, Lord. We thank you for this in Jesus' name.